really excited to hear what you have to say. Sounds good. All right, thanks, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming down and uh, the this, uh, this San Francisco Java Meetup group for having us and Heavy Bid and all the good people who have helped. So without further ado, let's get into it. So a bit about me, as Sasha said, uh, I'm one of the founders at Takipi. I've been writing code for the past, I would say, 16 years. Uh, my background is in real time and high scale systems and aerospace, which I did for like eight years. So a lot of work in uh, C++, Java, real time stuff. Then uh, our first company was also built out built products for architects and engineers, but like real world architects and engineers to kind of build bridges and uh, airports and all those kind of interesting things. It was actually through the process of scaling out that service, which today hosts I think like 50 million people, that we came across some of the pain points and challenges uh, that kind of brought the, the idea of Takipi with a strong emphasis on the word pain. What we really wanted to have is like, and always, so we wanted something essentially that would, would tell us when and why code breaks in production. So we built this kind of always on debugger, which tells you, you know, when something bad happens in production at scale, what is, what's the source code, what's the variable state that actually caused that error to be and let you prioritize that very efficiently. Um, and what I want to talk about today really is less about that, but really about some really um, efficient techniques that have to do with being able to, d to debug code at scale in production much more efficiently based on research that we've done and the experience we've uh, accumulated as a team over the years and working with our many customers and share those techniques with you um, to hopefully you guys will find them uh, useful to your everyday work. In general, check out the blog at Takipi. Uh, it's not a product blog, it's essentially all the stuff they are talking about today uh, is based on research that we do and we publish there. A lot of benchmarks, a lot of things about new ways to debug and new ways to essentially deploy and work with code at scale. Now, uh, one note that was brought up here is how to pronounce the names. I'm definitely going to go into that. For those of you which are kind of curious, uh, let's see how this thing works. Uh, this is Taki and this is Kipi. And they're essentially how we named the company. So it's uh, Takipi and they're the company dog. So this is kind of, uh, if people are curious about the name, this is the reason why. All right, let's get into it. Um, let's see, is this clicker clicking? It's clicking. All right, so I want to talk about today about a few uh, techniques for production debugging. Some of those which I, I can you know are very, uh, I wouldn't say foundational, but some of the things that I know we've seen a lot of people use and, uh, and we use in our everyday work and we feel that are very kind of uh, helpful to people. So we're going to talk about them and then we're going to go to start going more and more into some deep or more advanced stuff, okay? Which is also very interesting and kind of shows you how the JVM works kind of um, behind the scenes. So a lot of interesting stuff around that. The, thirst, the first thing we want to talk about really is techniques for thread naming. Uh, and, we'll talk, and we'll see exactly why that thing, which is actually, you know, the thread name property is one of Java's kind of unsung heroes, okay? It's like something we all know that's there, but we don't really use it. So I want to show you some interesting uses and techniques in which you can put it into really, really good and efficient use. So, um, Essentially, this is what we all know uh, as a stack dump, okay? When we debug, uh, sorry, as a, as a thread dump. When we debug in production uh, today, and it doesn't matter if you use uh, JStack or Profile or Mission Control or Visual VM, this is what we're used to seeing. And the problem here that we all know very well is that while we're able to see exactly what each thread is doing at the moment of the snapshot, we don't really know why it's doing it. We don't have no notion as to the variable state and you know when it actually started working. There's no state captured in, um, in this trace. And really for us to debug in production, debug is always about getting to the state which is causing that error whom we're which we're trying to fix. So the, the problem is that when the JVM takes a stack trace or stack dump, it doesn't really come to us and ask us, you know, what information do you want to put in that trace? But there's a caveat to that because there is one place that the, the JVM actually consults with us and that is the JVM name, uh, sorry, the thread name. Meaning if we were to say at, at every entry point leading to 
uh, a servlet or when you dequeue something, every entry point into our code, okay, if you're to set interesting, relevant information into the thread name, such as the context, the transaction ID, parameters passed to it, this will essentially mean that if we were to take uh, a, a, tr a trace, like a, like a thread dump, a second after, instead of seeing this, which we, what we usually see, we can be able, we'll be able to see stateful information within the stack trace itself. So for example, in this, what we do, you can embed into that, I'll show you exactly how that plays out in actual live stack trace in a second, you can, you can essentially plug into this uh, thread information like what's the current message ID? If this, if for example, if this, if this thread is dequeuing messages from a queue and processing them, what is the ID of the message? What queue are we dequeuing it from? What's the transaction ID? When, what's the current timestamp? Because the meaning for this would be the next time that we look at a, st at, at, at a stack trace, instead of seeing this, okay, what we'll be able to see is this. Actually, when you do a J stack and, uh, and a bunch of others we'll talk about in a second, it's you're moving from a state where you're not seeing any state within the thread to a place where you can see, oh, okay, this is what this thread is doing. And so if you're looking at 100 threads, take a practical example where you have a server that's hanging and you've just got like a, like a thread dump of it, okay? If you use this technique effic efficiently within your code, you can very easily immediately see the threads which started, um, which one started, uh, which one started first. And by doing that, you can say, all right, these are the ones which have been working for the longest. These are the ones that are probably at a, vi at a very high probability causing this machine to hang. And then you can go in and not only see the time in which they started, but you can actually see all the parameters uh, passed on to them. So instead of just getting a JSTAC and then try to figure it out, all right, I'm seeing like, a hundred queries, okay? But which of those are, is the one that's actually hanging, okay? This is something that happened yesterday. So I don't really have any context here. If you use this technique, you'll immediately be able to see exactly when that thread started and any other relevant information to embed it to it. Now, this will work regardless of which tool you're using. Meaning if you're using J console or mission control, if you're using a profile or commercial tool, this will always play into it. So I would say that in terms of uh, production debugging, using thread naming in an intelligent way is something that is super helpful. And I've used it so many times that nowadays when I debug and I see like just bare thread names when I'm getting like a stack trace or like even when a JVM crashed and looking at the HSCRR, okay, and like the first thing I look is the actual state that we embedded into that. Now, this actually plays uh, in an even a bigger role and what happens if code crashes, for example, and even you're not using like uh, uh, a thread dump. For example, if you have an uncaught exception in your code, essentially a thread killer, something that's gonna essentially uh, terminate either the thread or return it to the thread pool. So what we need to do as engineers, we need to make sure we set an uncaught exception handler onto that thread. And the thing that's most important, that at that point, when that thread crashes, okay, there's no longer any variable state embedded into it other than the thread name that we put in, okay? So I think one affecting, one really strong effective technique that we use in debugging, production debugging a lot nowadays and is really an efficient use. And I'm gonna talk about how that also plays out in a bunch of other number, in a number of scenarios. We actually have a great blog post about it, about five techniques to improve your server logging. So which, another four, which I haven't talked about here, which I encourage you to uh, use or to take a look at. Another thing I want to talk about, and all these stuff, and the thing we'll be talking about here, the demos are available on GitHub, is how to use JSTACs, JSTACs and thread dumps better. Um, I think, you know, most of us have been using JSTOC for a long time, and thread dumps in general, just to understand when something bad happens, when something crashes, when something hangs, when looking at JV and trying to figure out, we'll probably use uh, something like a JSTAC or any tool essentially to give us that thread dump. Uh, really a production debugging foundation. Now, th there's two problems uh, inherent with those kind of tools, especially in production. The first one is there's no state, right? So this is something that we just talked about, how we can actually embed state into every thread um, that we use. The second one, the second problem is that um, we can only use those tools, okay, when actually we're there. I mean, in production, when something happens, we're usually not there uh, to do anything. Now we only get there in retrospect. This is different 
than uh, when you debug debugging normally and we're there when the issue happens. Um, what we want to have essentially is the ability to have preemptive J stacks, meaning thread dumps that happen when, some things, when bad things happen with us without us having to be there. And the key to doing that, this is another effective technique that we've been employing quite a lot, is how to programmatically create thread dumps. So one of the things that we do is um, the ability to actually execute JSTAC on yourself when something bad happens in your code. Meaning, if your server drops or, or goes above a specific application threshold in terms of throughput, uh, you would probably want to log that. And not just log that, be able to log uh, a stateful thread dump. It will show you exactly what the server was doing at that point. So if you get called in a few hours later and, all, and, and that instance has already been started or it's no longer happening, which is the case with production bugs which are usually kind of sporadic, this technique actually enables you to uh, have the kind of the software self-debug itself. When something bad happens, essentially be able to come in and activate JSTAC on yourself. So you see here, uh, just opening up a process, this is an interesting technique, how to get your own PID using the uh, runtime MX bin uh, factory. All this stuff is up on GitHub. And then th the next bit is, when something bad happens in your code, you have a thread which is looking for a specific uh, throughput threshold. And if something goes be below that, you can activate JSTAC on yourself and essentially create a situation where you log a pretty rich thread dump which also has state tell you exactly what that server was doing at that time. Another example, which we all blogged about recently, I think it was a guest post, is how to do that when you deadlock. So a lot of times, one of the things that you can do, actually, is you can detect deadlocks internally within your application. And when you deadlock, you can activate a JSTAC on yourself. Because deadlocks are very sporadic. They, every, they happen every now and then, and they, it's hard to get to them in production when they happen. So one of the cool things you can do much in the same way that if you fall below or go above a specific threshold or you deadlock internally, you can essentially uh, create a JSTAC uh, and target at yourself. And this is kind of result what you'll be looking at. We can actually see state for each of those threads. So, so far we've talked about, I'm going to kind of switch gears here, we've talked about our ability to uh, create better thread dumps and to insert uh, state into them. The problem with this technique is that the state that we're able to capture is fairly limited, right? We only, we're essentially just a string, okay? What happens if you want to go much more dynamic? We don't know exactly what is it that we need when something bad happens. Let's talk about a few tools that we can use essentially to get to dynamic state within the JVM without restarting it in production. Uh, my favorite tool, I, I would say, out of all the tools that are out there, uh, and a lot of people don't know about it, uh, is Btrace. So this is an amazing tool. It's essentially an open source uh, application which uses a Java agent, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, which essentially lets you uh, run Metascripts, kind of inject code dynamically into a live JVM without restarting it and without modifying uh, any of its state. So you're, not, you're, you're doing it in a way which is read-only, so it's production safe. It's not as if you can go in and start playing with variables, but it gives you a very powerful ability to go into a JVM and see exactly what's happening within it using an interesting uh, language. The con is you can only read, you can only, uh, the kind of querying or introspection you can do is read-only, which on the surface of things uh, sounds good, but there's a caveat to that because just by the mere virtue of you not being able to modify anything, there's a ton of stuff you can't do. Meaning, for example, if you want to come in and log something at a specific point, you want to say that JVM, okay, log something where that happens. And doing that dynamically, you can't do that here because logging by itself changes the application state. Or if, say, for example, let's take an even simpler example. You want the, to print the content uh, of an array or an array list. You can't do a loop because a loop, you know, has the potential essentially to, go, to run infinitely, which from Btrace perspective, makes it unsafe. Having said that, there's a huge list of restrictions, so, but don't worry, it's actually a super powerful tool and you can do some amazing things with it. And there's actually techniques we'll talk about that can let you override those restrictions. So when we look, about, uh, when we look at Btrace, essentially, what it enables us to do is to write these scripts, which are very similar to Java code, and essentially be able to take those and inject them into a running JVM. Uh, for example, this script, what it does, it lets us uh, print out to the screen whenever, anywhere 
some, wherever anybody in the application writes to a specific file. That's pretty powerful. You're trying to figure out who's writing to this file under, under, under specific conditions, okay? So essentially you're injecting into uh, dynamically without changing the JVM state, without putting it at risk, injecting code into the, uh, into the uh, Java uh, IO output stream to say, all right, when, th when, this th when this thing happens or we're writing to a specific file, let me know about it. So the kind of syntax that you see here, it's interesting. Essentially, you're writing a little script and you're telling Btrace where to put it in. And, uh, and, the, and the language is Java, as you see. So essentially, you're writing a little JavaScript, a Java method. You annotate it where, where you want it to be injected. Then you take the script, you do Btrace, the PID, a point to your file, and that's it. Btrace will compile it, will verify, will let you know if, if it works, and if so, let you inject that. So again, another example, class loading. A lot of times we have no idea who's loading that class, what is the stack trace by which this class is being loaded. You know, you're, not, you're, getting, you're getting kind of debugging class loader hell, if you will. So this is a cool way to say, well, you know what? Every time somebody's loading a file, okay, inject that script, or somebody, when everybody's, somebody's loading a class or a specific class, give me a JSTAC, which is interesting because it also ties into our previous uh, technique. So uh, this is another cool application for it. But another one I want to show you is really powerful. Show me whenever, I want to inject code, Whenever somebody allocates a new character array, anything, anywhere within the application, and you can write a script here, which is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out who's allocating large string arrays, for example, with a specific set of values in them, okay? That's hard to do anywhere within the application. You can take the script, essentially, uh, put in whatever you want, printing, you know, um, the, the content, doing any querying, you can look at the stack, and then inject that very quickly. Now, the, the cool thing about Btrace, it comes with this huge library of samples, so it's not as if you have to, which covers like a hundred different use cases, from connection pools to uh, overflowing maps to memory allocations. So essentially all you really have to do is familiar yourself with that library and then just use that. And then you can kind of play on those and, and manipulate those. So you, I really, you really have to start from scratch. So this is a tool which I would uh, really kind of gladly recommend you guys familiarize yourself with because it's super helpful uh, in situations and because by, it, by design, it's not a state mutating tool. It's safe for production. So if you can come in and op steam and you say, well, don't change anything or don't do anything to the JVM, this is a very safe tool to use. You can see here, uh, you can also do cool stuff like timers and you'll tell them print out every millisecond. There's a bazillion things this tool can do. So I gladly recommend, I, I kind of warmly recommend that you guys look into it. But as I said, this tool is limited, meaning, um, there's a we see, you know, there's such a huge list of restrictions here. And one of the things that we like to do a lot of times is, you know, I want when I'm debugging something in production to be able to come in and say, well, you know what? When something bad happens, I want to log it, okay? I want to, uh, I want to get it, uh, or for example, when something bad happens, I want to get a stateful stu uh, thread stack, a dump of whatever happened. So to be able to do that, you cannot do that with JStack, sorry, with Btrace, but you can actually use that with Java agents, which is another very powerful technique within Java that you can use. Java agents are essentially uh, an advanced technique for modifying uh, code as it's running. And it has so many uses. It's essentially the foundation that all the, all the profiling techniques, all the debuggers that we use, and all the commercial tools that we use today, the vast majority of them use this technique. And uh, the JVM actually has two types of agents uh, that it can run for you. Completely different things. Uh, each has its own kind of strengths uh, and weaknesses. Now, the pros of using this technique when you're trying to figure out or do something in production to get a specific state, uh, the pros, it's extremely powerful. You can do anything you want. You can change code dynamically. You can say, Anytime somebody's invoking a specific servlet with this specific set of conditions anywhere within the app, I want you to do this. Anytime somebody's logging, anytime somebody, you, you can go essentially and ask anything you can possibly want. Now, the cons here is that unlike Btrace, in which you use a Java syntax to express what you want the JVM to do in runtime, Java agents uh, require uh, bytecode which is a much, much lower level, which is kind of a bummer. But I'll show you guys a technique on how to overcome that, 
Okay, so essentially, if you look at a Java agent, okay, essentially it's it's it runs like a very it runs exactly like uh, a standard Java, Java application, but instead of having uh, which will JVM will load for you in real time, you can use uh, J console for example or Visual VM to attach a piece of uh, a Java agent we just wrote into the JVM live. You don't have to restart. Remember the whole point here is you don't have to restart your JVM at any time. Uh, this is all live stuff. So instead of having a main, which is you know the entry point which uh, the JVM will invoke for you, you have something different, which the JVM recognizes called a pre-main, which is essentially you get arguments, but what's more important, you get a reference to a point to, to an object called instrumentation, which essentially enables you to instrument code. And it does that by letting you add object called transformers. Transformers are essentially means for you to say, all right, I want to transform this class because I want to add these bits of code to it. And the powerful thing here is this can be any class. This doesn't have to be code that you wrote, which makes it much more powerful. If you're trying to debug a third-party library that's doing wacky stuff, like a caching framework or something, you're trying to figure out what's happening there, uh, and you don't want to change the code, and you don't want to change the code, you don't want to rebuild that artifact, this is a great way, essentially, to add in code that lets you weave your stuff into it. And the way you do that, essentially, all you have to do is implement a super easy uh, interface called class file transformer which has practically one method, okay, which is transform, okay? You can ask him, I want to I essentially transform one class, uh, and I want to take its bytecode, and I want to mod modify it. As I said, the problem here is that you have to work with bytecode. But the good news is there are amazing libraries and tools which automate most of that work to you, for you, that to the point that you get fluent and kind of uh, get a bit of practice with them, it becomes second nature. The best one which I use, and a lot of tools used to nowadays, is called ASM. Um, here we see an example of how essentially we're taking a class file and we're saying, all right, I want to change that class file. Specifically, I want to I change a method in that file. So once, you, this, is used as, um, this technique uses a visitor method, a, a, vis a visitor pattern, sorry, where essentially um, you're loading up bytecode and then at the end, once you know when all the visit, when that method is ended, essentially here what I'm doing is I'm adding a call. I'm telling you, you know what? weave a call into my class called hook or whatever class that I want, which essentially calls anything that I want to do. So I can come in and say, you know, you know what? Transform all the servlets in the application. So whenever they start, I want them to call into my code first. Okay? Or if this is a caching library, whenever it calls into a specific method, put or get from the cache, call into my code. Now the thing is, to actually weave that stuff in, can be tricky because you have to know a bit of bytecode, especially if you want to add like ifs or stuff. This is where I recommend you guys uh, take a look at this beautiful plugin that's available through ASM called the AS ASMifier, which essentially enables you to write in your IDE Java code and have the plugin dynamically show you the ASM representation of it, which means all you have to do is just write the code that you want to write and then take the code which it automatically generates for you and paste it into your visitor. At that point, by doing that, essentially, you can uh, you have the part to do anything with the JVM. You can essentially go to any class, any set of classes within the JVM, be it your code, be it yours or third party, and essentially do what you want, change the code there in runtime to log things, to get stack dumps, to query variables, all that good stuff. The second, uh, the second group of uh, agents which I want to talk about are called native agents, okay? This is a whole nother beast. This is actually, if, you're, if you really, really go, want to go super deep, this is as deep as you can possibly go with the JVM. This is essentially saying, I want to write code that enables me not to just debug my code or change bytecode. I want to essentially want to get access to everything that's happening within the JVM. Now, you probably want to have a very good reason to do that, OK? and something that a lot of vendors use uh, when they build tools, and we use that as well. But it's a great thing to know about. So essentially, native agents are written in C++. So that's one big change. Essentially, you're writing at the JVM level. You're no longer, uh, you're no, you're no longer writing in Java. It's super low level in a sense. You're using something called JVMTI. It's a super robust API in C++ provided to you by the JVM. And the reason for it being, it enables you to do super powerful stuff. For example, you want to get a callback 
every time the JVM starts garbage collecting and or when garbage collection starts and ends, you can do that. Do you want to get a callback every time the JVM um, synchronizes a monitor? You can do that. You want to set a breakpoint and pause execution programmatically when something happens. So you can debug or something, you can do that as well. Anything that you can you know, anything that you've ever seen any debugger or you know or tool do, you can achieve using that uh, that API. You can tell them, you know what, whenever somebody changes the value of this field anywhere within the app, I want to get a callback. When everybody when, when, whenever an exception gets thrown within the JVM, I want to call back on that as well. And the API is super rich and super robust. So on one end, it's great. Uh, even like uh, if there's more stuff, you're like threading, JIT compile. You want to get a, a callback whenever the JVM compi JIT compiles the method. You can get, you can do that as well. Um, so on one hand, it's amazing because you have all these amazing capabilities, but there are severe cons here. Okay, one, it's much more complex to write. Meaning this to actually nail it down and to get a live native agent running in Java. It's something that usually, if you're trying to fix a problem, if you've gotten to a, pro to, to a, you know, to a position where this is what you're contemplating, wow, oh my <laughs> you're dealing with some super hard stuff. Um, so this, because it can take, just a master technique of doing that can take somewhere between days and weeks to actually get, to figure out exactly how to you know, plug it in and get it to work. The second bit is it's platform dependent. I mean, you're writing in C++, so all that stuff, you know, you're writing for Windows, or you have to get the thing to compile. And this is something that we as Java developers don't think about, but this, you know, if you want to have this thing run on your, on your Mac, on your Windows, you're going to have to spend a lot of time getting this thing to compile. And the last bit, which is kind of probably the, kind of the, the biggest thing about it, because you're writing at the, J at, at the, your, the code that you're going to be uh, uh, writing is going to operate at the JVM level, you're no longer protected by the JVM. Meaning, if you generate, uh, you, you're, you're out of the land of null pointers. Every mistake that you're going to make is a sig sig, and it essentially will kill the JVM. So you have to be super careful about that. So on one hand, it's like with great power come great, comes great responsibility. This is the classical example. You know, on one hand, you can do amazing stuff with it. On the other hand, you have to spend a lot of time on it and make sure your code is super stable. Uh, one more, one more piece, uh, one more kind of. Uh, interesting component which I wanted to cover with you guys today has to do with uh, something called the serviceability API. So this is an, uh, I'll upload the example today. So essentially, uh, I know this is another extremely powerful tool that not a lot of people know about within the kind of JVM uh, ecosystem and sp talking specifically about HSDB. Essentially, this is an amazing tool. This, I would say after Btrace, this is probably my, or, and, and of course JSTAC, this is my third go-to tool. HSDB essentially is an out-of-process debugger which lets you connect to the JVM, okay, and essentially introspect the entire memory spec of the JVM and do amazing things. You can query, you can have like SQL-like queries. We essentially uh, iterate through the entire heap to search for a specific object in the JVM. So we're not just talking about a profile which shows you, all right, this is, how many this is how many string objects you have, this is how many characters. You can actually see specific variable states. So this is an extremely powerful tool. Not only that, it comes with an extremely powerful API. And I'll show you guys some very, very interesting stuff you can do with it. So essentially, if we look at this tool, um, the kind of things that you can do here are kind of mind-blowing, meaning you can actually come in and see histograms, or you can come in and say, well, you know what? Show me all the string objects that whose values, or show me all the objects where this field is equal to that. You're using something called um, OQL, Object Query Language, which I'm not going to go into that now, but it's a, very, it's a very easy syntax. And essentially, you can do that and kind of zoom in on every piece of state you want within a live JVM, again, without restarting it. Uh, and the thing is, this is also, this runs out of process. You essentially load, load, load up HSDB, and you just uh, attach to a live JVM. You don't have to have specific uh, permissions or something. And that moment, you can start getting all this data. Now, what I wanted to show you today is actually, and I wanted to do at least one kind of live demo, is show you some cool stuff that you can do. Because when I started playing with this tool, the thing which, uh, which kind of boggled my mind is like, how can an external application essentially be able to come in and introspect 
another you know, an, an application completely out of process you know, and be able to understand exactly what's going on without, with, with the managed heap without the first application, the JVM, actually telling it. You know, this is you know, the, the, the segments in the memory where the objects are. You know, there's got to be some way in which you know, the JVM reports all that information out to HSDB. And that's super interesting to me because the kind of information you can get from that tool, there's no other tool which can give that to you. That level of information, again, it comes with the JVM. I encourage you guys to play with it. So the thing is, and this is what I'm going to show you, is actually the JVM, the JVM has an amazing system okay, that's available to all the developers, and you can use that to essentially expose everything that's going on within it. Like, did you ever think about, hmm, I actually want to run on all the objects that are currently in the heap regardless if I have a direct pointer to them or not, because I'm looking for something, or I want to, to do a histogram. You can do that with this API, even programmatically. The key to the castle is the JVM exposes, essentially, its entire internal uh, object structure system to anyone who's interested in it, as a part of the serviceability API. Which means, you know, every object, meaning every generation uh, in, in, in the managed heap, every thread, Every, the compiler, every object within the JVM, the direct objects are powering the JVM, are exposed to you through that. And you can access those uh, in runtime. So I'm going to show you, uh, and just to give you kind of a sense of the kind of, pow the, the kind of power that you have, you can Google all this stuff up. For example, you see the, J the JVM hotspot GC interface collected heap. So this, these are all fairly documented classes, a fairly kind of documented API you can use essentially in Java to come and essentially query, see all the regions within the JVM, uh, all the memory regions, or a Java thread, see all the frames, everything that's going on within it. It's a super powerful stuff. And I'll show you a demo in a second how to approach that. Or in this case, you know, this is the main class. This is the runtime hotspot.vm. This is a singleton, which is exposed to you, which you can use essentially to, uh, this is the keys to the castle, like the whole universe, which is uh, a list of all the memory regions allocated by the JVM. And not only that, a way to iterate on those and actually get access to all the objects that are live within the JVM at a specific moment in time or get all the threads that are running and not just at, at, and, and see their uh, a representation of them not just as Java threads, we all know, but as actual OS threads and be able to get access to all that stuff. And just the amount of, the amount of things you can do here is just mind-boggling, just in terms of... Uh, your ability to interact with all the internal systems, the string tables, the object heap, uh, it's all here. What I wanted to show you, for example, is how a small demo where essentially you can come in, I'm going to show you a demo how you can essentially run and iterate on all, on, all the spa on all the regions within the manager heap in a safe way using plain Java code. So uh, let's see. Essentially, the way that you kind of uh, connect yourself into that system, go to VM type system. This is all the code. I'm going to put this code. This code is going to be on GitHub. This is all the code you need to put in place. It's not a lot. Actually, all you do, you, you, you access those, symbol, those symbols, which the JVM uh, shares, it, which it exports to you as native, symbol, native symbols. And essentially, what you do is you do this loop here, which iterates on all these symbols and builds a reflection map. I'll show you an, an example of that in a second, okay? Essentially kind of a, like a, a manifest of all the classes of the JVM and where they are in memory. And once you have that, all, the, all you need to do essentially to, uh, to do some pretty cool stuff is go to heap scanner. You initialize it, and then you say, all right, give me the parallel scavenger heap. Okay, give me the actual heap, give me a pointer to the actual heap in memory. Give me a pointer to the actual young generation. And give me a pointer to the old generation, to immutable space, okay? Give me the classism. This is like, think about like reflecting into the JVM, okay? And this is all safe stuff. This is all something that the JVM exports to you. So you can do pretty cool things with that. And then once you have those, you can say, all right, give me the actual address values of those in memory. The actual regions within the JVM, get those, map those into, into a simple array, and start iterating on those and search for a specific value. Now, this is a very, very, this is a very simple demo, but you can leverage the serviceability API to do sophisticated queries, not to just to run 
on the manager heap raw, but to actually run it as objects. So you can say specifically look for a specific object with specific values or attributes. And this is something that's very, very powerful when you're trying to debug in production and you have this technique. And you can essentially come in and incorporate uh, things from the serviceability API into your code. So this is another kind of tool uh, which I wanted to share with you guys. Um, anyway, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff uh, which I wanted, which we blog about, as I said, that we, I think can be interesting to you if you haven't checked it out. So um, a, a bunch of series of recent posts we did about like land drives expression in Java 8 and uh, a lot of stuff we didn't get a chance to talk about today, like toolings that you can use for debugging productions, commercial tools. Uh, in this talk, I only spoke about touch about some of the tools that come into JVM. So this is another thing which I kind of encourage you guys to check out. And um, so anyways, with that, I'm going to say thank you and uh, hopefully see if people have any questions. No, this is, this is the entire premise of Btrace, meaning the way that it's built is it does not allow you to invoke any code which is not in the Btrace libraries which are safe. Meaning it will not compile the script. It also, the syntax, the reason why it's kind of quasi-Java but it's not Java, it doesn't let you do keywords like for or for example or while or those kind. It doesn't let you throw an exception. It doesn't let you allocate. There's no new in it. Essentially what it does, it, takes, it, it has a little compiler which takes the Bscript language and compiles it into bytecode. So there's no, and it checks to see that all the stuff that you're doing is, uh, is safe. Otherwise, it will not compile. So that is the whole premise. And I think that's also why people, especially it's an easier sell in organization if you have like ops people and you want to introduce this thing versus, hey, I just wrote a custom Java agent and I'm like, playing around with the bytecode or I just wrote a native agent. I can crash the JVM at, at any moment in time. So like why Btrace really uh, if you're going to the hardcore production, is a great tool just because it's so benign. So that's why it's a good trade-off between it being benign and you being able to introduce it into production fairly easily. No, the beautiful thing about uh, about thread naming is just it's part of the thread class. All you have to do is just essentially, if you haven't the, the only th no, just two things: set the thread name. Also, make sure you use a try finally clause. I've seen people set the thread name get an odd code exception essentially, and then uh, that thread is now dirty with a, with, with a name, with, with a naming, with a state which essentially has nothing to do with it. So as long as you do a try, finally clause, and then set the name correctly. And again, this is a technique which will manifest across whatever tool you use. Even in Eclipse, okay? Even if you're doing something, in a, even in local debugging, you, if you have a list, like if you look in a Tomcat container, you've got like 200 threads on it, okay? Even in the debugging view, the thread name will play a part there. So that, JSTAC, any commercial tool that you might be using, mission control, visual VM, all these, this plays into that. That's like, out of all these techniques, you know, some are like, like I would say, you know, B-Trace and this is kind of straightforward stuff. The other kind is more advanced. I would say there's really no reason why not to do it. I highly encourage you guys to. Yeah, so HSDB, so HSDB okay, essentially uh, is read-only as well. HSDB, um, now it does enable you to edit stuff. It's actually pretty cool what they do there. They use an actual Windows or Linux debugger to connect because an, it's an out of process connection. The, the sample which I showed you is actually inter process. So within your code from within the JVM, you can introspect yourself by loading up the time, by, by loading up the time, the type system manually. So, but those tools, um, well, Btrace is read only, those tools can potentially alter state. HSDB is a console tool. For the most part, you don't alter state. It's not, the, it's not the purpose of the tool, but you can actually go in and change stuff. I think, they, I th I think you can do that, but that's, that's something which I usually will not recommend to do in, uh, in production ad hoc, but it, it is possible. So let's see. B so uh, Btrace will work with non-sound VMs because it uses simple Java edge. Java agents will work with the non-gen VM. The, uh, the JVM TI is a specification, meaning any JVM should support it. Um, thread names, of course, because they're Java. The only bit here, which is Sun-specific, 
is uh, the serviceability agent and then HSDB because these are not developed, they're not a part of the specification. So out of all these techniques, they're the only ones which will open work for open JDK and hotspot. But if you're using like a V9 or like a, or like an, uh, like a Zing, uh, I can't guarantee that that will work. Cool. Uh, any other questions? All right. Three, two, one. Thank you guys a lot. <laughs>